Do you like ninjas? That's a silly question. Who doesn't like ninjas? <laughs> okay, do you like playing highly mobile characters who can teleport all over the battlefield, go in the blink of an eye from being invisible to doing massive burst damage, and then disappear again in a cloud of smoke? I mean, yeah, that sounds awesome, right? If you agree with me, then you're gonna love today's video. Welcome to D4. Hey everybody, so here at D4, each week we take a deep dive into character builds for our favorite role-playing games, usually D&D or D&D adjacent. I like to crunch numbers about them, theorycraft about them, not so that I can tell you the right way or the best way to play a certain character, but to explore one potential way to play something in the hopes of creating a character that is both really fun, but also really powerful to play in game. So if you enjoy creating characters for your favorite role-playing games almost as much as you enjoy playing the actual game itself, or if you're just looking for tips or ideas on how to build something that you're thinking about playing, then welcome home. This is where you belong, and I'm so glad you're here. So thank you for watching. My name's Colby. If you enjoy what I do on this channel, I'd appreciate it if you'd consider joining as a member. There's a little button down there that says join. If you click on it, it'll tell you about all the little perks you can get by being a member, including, but not limited to, uh, write-ups for these builds that I do so that you can recreate them yourself a little easier, access to the community the Discord server filled with lots of wonderful, lovely people, and even access to the live monthly Q&A hangout sessions that we do. I want to give a huge thank you and shout out to all my channel members. You guys are so awesome. I truly could not do this without you. Thank you. And everybody else, thank you too. Just being here and watching and especially liking and subscribing and clicking on the notifications bell, these are all great ways to support the channel too. So if you don't want to or don't feel like you can afford to join as a member, that's fine. I'm just glad you're here. Right, so when people talk about rogue subclasses, they seem to all agree that one subclass reigns supreme over all others in Baldur's Gate 3, the thief. This may come as a surprise to the D&D exclusive players out there who haven't dabbled much in Baldur's Gate 3 yet. And the reason for this though is simple. Thieves get two bonus actions every single turn. It's a little overpowered, I think, and especially coupled with a build that makes great use of a bonus action like a Berserker Barbarian or an Open Hand Monk, ding, uh, or even just a high-powered Dual Wielder like that, then yeah, Thief is really, really good. But is it always the most powerful rogue subclass? I don't think so. Because you see, Assassins in Baldur's Gate 3 are insanely good as well. If you build and play around their skill set, right? And especially, I think, if you're playing the game solo. Now, okay, what's the fascination with solo builds? The last two or three Baldur's Gate 3 builds that I've done have all talked at some point about how this build would probably be great for solo play, right? And I always do this whenever I say those things. <laughs> Isn't this game meant to be played in a party, don't you miss out on all kinds of great interaction between companions, fantastic, sometimes poignant, sometimes funny banter and reactions to your character that really enrich the game in a number of ways? Absolutely. However, there are some benefits to playing solo as well. First up, it provides a greater challenge, so that can be fun. Second, it makes the game go a lot quicker in my experience, so you're not having to like fiddle around with multiple characters, getting them into just the right place, making sure they're specced and geared exactly like you want want them and they're all concentrating on the right spell for the situation, etc, etc, right? So yeah, especially I think if you've beat the game once or twice or five times and you feel like you don't really need to get all that fantastic interaction, or maybe you just want to play a character who's like kind of that lone wolf archetype, right? It can really be a lot of fun. It definitely mixes the game up. That's not to say that the build that we're going to go over today has to be played solo or doesn't work very well in a party or anything. Thing, it will work absolutely great mixed in with allies. I just think it's the most fun when played solo, personally. And for my money, no character is better suited to a solo run of BG3 than the Assassin Rogue. Or at least a character with a few levels of Assassin Rogue sprinkled into the build. What we'll end up with today is a character that's great at all of those important lockpicking and trap disarming skills, a character that can sneak into and out of places that you feel like you'd rather bypass, a character who's incredibly mobile and who, yes, does really fantastic burst damage and decent sustained damage to boot with 
decent survivability, and lots of ways to get out of jail if the tide of the battle turns against you. And they play so much differently than any other build I've used so far in any of my playthroughs anyway, that it's made the game feel really fresh, really exciting, and yeah, more fun than it's been for me in several weeks. So let's build it. I proudly present a BG3 episode number 14, The Ultimate Assassin. But First, I am super excited, you guys, to tell you about a new sponsor this week, a just launched Kickstarter project called The Wandering Tavern, coming to us from Homie and the Dude, the father and son team that gave us Sky Zephyrs, a previously successful 5e compatible Kickstarter project. Anyways, The Wandering Tavern, this looks so cool. It's a 150 page traveler's guide to an expansive Studio Ghibli inspired floating TTRPG setting. It totally reminds me of like Howl's Moving Castle. It's so awesome. Explore this immense soaring city with battle maps that detail its every nook and cranny. Delve into the devious underbelly of the tavern while getting to know its wide range of unique NPC patrons and staff. The Wandering Tavern's dark mysteries and entangled truths are yours to unlock. While traversing this vast metropolis, use remarkable magic items to protect yourself from the twisted spirits stalking the halls. However, if you have to escape, you can glide through uncharted skies on never-before-seen zephyrs constructed from a plethora of brand new parts and stations. So guys, this wandering tavern book is going to have so much great stuff. Tons of history and lore, 15 giant battle maps, 33 plug-and-play NPCs, 30 different plot hooks, six new plug-and-play Zephyrs, which, yeah, in case you didn't know, they're airships, right? But these actually come equipped with D&D 5e stat blocks. Tons of new magic items, 13 setting-themed recipes, even, to help you scratch your crafting itch. There's even downtime games, unique celebrations, holidays, and even a Sky Zephyrs quick start guide to help you jump right in. Also important to know is that Wandering Tavern is actually a system agnostic setting, so it will work with other TTRPGs too if you want to plug it into Pathfinder or something. And while it has everything you need for a complete campaign, if you already have an established world or setting or I mean, heck, even if you're playing an official Wizards of the Coast adventure, right? The Wandering Tavern is the perfect unique pit stop for your players to visit. Take a load off and delve into something new if you're looking to change it up a bit. So hey, you should totally go back this Kickstarter. Go check it out. Use the URL that I've posted in the video description if you would. That way they know I sent you. I'm putting it in the pinned comment as well. I'm sure that it will already be funded by the time you're seeing this. Their last project only took like four hours to fund. So go help them hit their next stretch goal and, you know, pick up those Kickstarter exclusive goodies before it's too late. Huge thanks to Homie and the Dude. It just really warms my heart actually to see a father and a son team working together to make awesome 5e compatible stuff. Can't wait to see the finished product here. And let's jump into the build. Before we get started, really quick housekeeping item. Um, next week is a spring break where I live. And so I'm going to take the week off and have a little vacation with my family. So no video next week. And I'm probably not going to really be checking comments much at all either. So please don't be offended if you post something and I don't reply or give it a heart or whatever. Um, yeah, really looking forward to it. I could definitely use the break. Okay, that's it. All right. At level one for our starting class, yes, I think we should start rogue on this build. Since nobody has extra attack until level five, Damage-wise, rogues are going to be about as good as anyone, and better than most if you can consistently get the drop on your enemies, which we will be doing. What's more, especially for solo play, it just makes things a lot easier from like a trap disarming and lock picking perspective if you can start as rogue, right? And rogues do get more skill proficiencies than any other class, so we can at least be decent in like the most important skills, even if we don't otherwise have a great ability score to bolster those skills. As for race, I don't usually recommend race. I think any will work fine, but I think my favorite here, honestly, would either be a high elf or a half elf with the high elf subclass. And the main reason is so that we could get the friends cantrip. You start off with a free cantrip, right, from the wizard spell list. That might surprise some of you, but in Baldur's Gate 3, the friends cantrip is really pretty dang good. It simply gives you advantage on charisma checks against a non-hostile creature, and as we'll discuss in a minute, we're not 
not going to have a great charisma score on this build. And if we're playing solo, that might make important conversations a little challenging, right? Friends is a cantrip, so it doesn't take up any resources, can be cast in the middle of a conversation whenever you need it, and then, yeah, just straight up gives you advantage on those persuasion, intimidation, or deception checks. And that will make you a moderately decent face character, even with a lowish charisma score, right? Especially if you can get proficiency in one or two of those skills, which, as a rogue, we should have no problem getting. As for our ability scores here, I'm gonna say let's get up to a 17 dexterity, a 14 constitution, a 16 wisdom, and then a 10 charisma. You could put the 16 in constitution for now if you wanted, but I do think later on we're gonna want our wisdom to be like our second most important stat. Now, that 17 dexterity doesn't really do us much good until we get a plus one bonus to an ability score of your choice from, spoiler alert, anti-Ethel, right? The hag, which I'm assuming we do here. So until then, feel free to go 16 dexterity and then you can maybe get like a 12 charisma, right? Yeah, it will be a bit of a bummer to have only a plus zero or a plus one to charisma for solo play, but again, with friends and by burning inspirations when it's really important, I found that I was able to be persuasive when I really needed to, right? For those important conversations that I really wanted to go a certain way. And I mean, hey, if you still fail your charisma check, part of the fun of the game is dealing with the consequences of bad rolls anyways, right? As for equipment here, eventually we're going to want to have the best one-handed finesse light weapons we can find. That's generally going to mean short swords, so we can attack with both our main hand with our action, right? And then our offhand with our bonus action, two weapon fighting. And then, you know, grab the best light armor that we can for now anyways and the best ranged weapon that we can find. I'll get into some important gear pieces a little bit later. Let me say this as well. Yes, this build would work great as a ranged build. Arguably, it might work even better. First of all, because yeah, you can get the sharpshooter feet to add more damage to ranged attacks. Secondly, because of all the really great arrows that you can get in the game that add damage and other effects to your ranged attacks, right? And third, because later on we will have an ability to cast darkness on ourselves, but still be able to see in that darkness. And no, we're not going to be taking warlock levels, in case you're wondering. And doing that tends to be more effective in this game if you're making ranged attacks from within said darkness. But in the end, I just really prefer the melee playstyle when I'm going for an assassin character. There's just that higher stakes stuff going on when you're sneaking in, putting a knife in your target's back, and then having to get out. That just makes it a lot more fun for me than like hiding far away and shooting stuff from range. But by all means, go with a ranged focus playstyle if you want and know that it will work great. When I played this build in game, I actually would do a bit of both. Mostly I'd go melee, but maybe in certain fights, depending on my equipment and who I was fighting, I might open up in ranged and then move into melee, or even in a few instances just stay ranged the whole time because I had really great position, some powerful arrows, etc. And that's the really great thing about being a dexterity focused character, right? you can do both. As a Rogue One then, we first up get the sneak attack feature. This tells us that so long as we're using a finesse or ranged weapon and we have either advantage on the target or they're standing next to one of our allies, we can do an extra D6 of damage once per turn and that scales with more Rogue levels. Unfortunately, I'm not planning on having allies with me in combat, generally speaking, meaning that we're only going to be triggering sneak attack when we have advantage. Fortunately, we're going to have advantage a lot, especially when we need it most, but we'll get into that later. Also, as a rogue one, we get expertise, which is so great. It lets us double our proficiency in two skills that we're proficient in, right? For me, I'm gonna take sleight of hand to really help increase our trap disarming and lock picking and pickpocketing when we need it. And then perception to make sure that we're seeing those traps and to avoid getting surprised ourselves, etc. At level two, rogues get cunning action, which lets us dash, disengage, or hide as a bonus action. And that's actually gonna be pretty important for this build, especially early on before we get some important skills from another class, which will let us more reliably vanish, we might find ourselves opening up on targets, trying to kill one or two of them before surprise wears off, and then running, dashing, and hiding, or just straight up fleeing combat to like reset the fight. Then go back in and repeat the process until we've picked off all of the enemies one by one. And yeah, no honor among thieves, uh, you know, or assassins, I suppose, in our case. I have no qualms about hiding or fleeing combat on this character. It's 
kind of the rules of engagement for rogues, right? At level three, rogues get their subclass, and yes, we're going assassin. So let's get into why assassins are just so dang good, especially in Baldur's Gate 3. First up, you've got the ambush feature. Just like in D&D, this tells us that any attacks we make against a surprised enemy is an automatic critical. Now, in Dungeons and Dragons, this is nice, but as I've often talked about in my D&D builds that really benefit from surprise, it's really, really hard to just kind of rely on surprising your enemies in that game. In my experience, at least, the majority of combat encounters don't even allow for a chance to get surprise, whether because you've got a noisy Leroy Jenkins-esque player at your table, or because you don't even know that combat is going to happen before it's just happening, etc., etc., right? But in this game, in BG3, especially if you've played through it a time or two, it feels like you can probably get surprise in what, 70% of the combat encounters, maybe more? You might be often skipping dialogue that you'd otherwise be having, but if you're playing the game like, I'm an assassin, I don't trust anyone, and I'm gonna stab first and ask questions later, then it works particularly fantastically. Is that too many adverbs? So let's break down surprise because how it works isn't really all that intuitive. If you attack an enemy when they don't know you're there because you're invisible or you've stealthed up behind them without being seen, then they're going to be surprised. The thing is, that initial attack that you make from stealth isn't made against a surprised enemy. You make the attack with advantage since you're unseen, so that's nice, meaning you can apply sneak attack, and then initiative gets rolled, right? But unless the enemy has like the alert feat or something similar, they're gonna be surprised on the first round, meaning they basically don't do anything on their turn. However, there's still a possibility that the enemy can beat you in their initiative role, meaning that by the time it's your turn, they will have already gone and then the surprised status has worn off, right? In that case, you're gonna want on this build to move to a target who did not beat you with their initiative role because they will still be surprised and yes, any hits you land on them will be critical hits, which is awesome because yeah, as a reminder, Critical hits double all damage dice rolls. They don't double any flat damage bonuses. So bonuses from your dexterity modifier, for example, just dice damage rolls, right? Like your weapon damage and yeah, sneak attack damage. One other note about attacking from stealth and then surprise as it pertains to dual wielding. Get really familiar with that little dual wielding toggle button right under your character's portrait, right? If you have that clicked so that you make both a main hand and off hand attack when you attack and, you know, automatically use up your bonus action, then when you attack from stealth, it will use both your main and off hand attacks right on that first attack. It'll do the same when you get an opportunity attack. So you're going to want to have that toggled on most of the time, only toggling it off if you know that your single attack action is going to finish off an enemy and you want to save that bonus action to do something else when they're dead. I'm talking after the initial attack that you make, right? And yeah, so if you think you're gonna need that bonus action to attack somebody else, or maybe dash, or hide, or disengage, right? Then untoggle that two-weapon fighting toggle. It can be kind of annoying. I often forget to do it myself. So as a general rule, I tend to leave it on, even though sometimes that means wasting my bonus action and making a bonus action attack against an enemy that I kind of would have killed anyways. We also get the assassinate initiative feature, which again, just like in D&D, tells us that we have advantage against anyone who hasn't taken a turn yet on that first round. As an aside, thanks to how much we benefit from going first in combat, some of you might be thinking we should be taking the alert feat on this build. If you want to, go for it. I found that by maximizing dexterity above all, I was pretty much going first in every combat encounter, unless the enemy had the alert feat themselves. I just don't know that it's worth it, honestly, but feel free to take it if you disagree. Anyways, this feature, uh, Assassinate Initiative, is great. Advantage means more reliable hits, and yeah, sneak attack. But it's actually the third feature that assassins get, uh, Assassin's Alacrity, which is unique to the subclass in BG3 that really makes them stand out in this game, I think. Because you see, for all other classes and subclasses, when you make that attack from stealth before combat begins, it actually uses your action for the first round of combat. What's worse, if you have extra attack, but you attack from stealth, it's going to use your full action to just make one single attack. Your extra attack just 
magically disappears. It's super annoying, actually. You could, of course, find a way to begin combat from stealth with a bonus action, even just manually clicking on the bonus action attack if you're dual wielding, and then making that bonus action attack. Then, yes, your bonus action will be used up for that first round of combat, but you'll still have your full action against the surprised enemy. Uh, this little fact kind of makes opening up on an enemy from stealth not particularly great for every other build in the game. Uh, sure, you have advantage on your attack, Attack, but you're not getting much benefit otherwise. But assassins? Thanks to the assassin's alacrity feature, you immediately restore your action and bonus action at the start of combat. This means that if you open up on your enemy from stealth, making two attacks, thanks to having that two weapon fighting button toggled on, when combat then immediately begins, you'll have both your action and your bonus action available again, and the enemy will be surprised, ready for your full turn of automatic critical hits loaded with sneak attack. And you're gonna be hitting really hard. It's hard. It's really hard. And again, don't forget that if the enemy is surprised, they're going to skip their first turn in combat, right? Meaning that you're very likely to get three full turns of attacks before most, if not all, of the enemies get to do anything. You opened up on them from surprise, that's one, right? Then you get your turn while the enemy is surprised, that's two. And then, as long as you rolled higher than them in the initiative order, you're going to get your turn before they get theirs, that's three. Considering that a couple of your attacks are going to be automatic critical hits, and you're adding a lot of sneak attack damage, that is some really strong burst potential. And for my money, easily keeps pace with the power of the thief subclass if you're building and playing around being an assassin. It is so much fun. Oh, and speaking of sneak attack, don't forget that it does 2d6 damage when you use it now at Rogue 3, right? All right, at level four, we get our first feat. And I'm gonna say let's increase our dexterity to add to both our hit chance and damage, but also to our armor class, our initiative, and important dex-based skills. Yeah, dexterity is still kind of the god stat uh, in this game, just like it is in D&D. Maybe a little less so here, but still really good. Now, if you get that plus one from anti-ethyl, that would let us be at a 20 at this point, which is awesome. That said, you might at this point in the game or very soon be able to get your hands on what might be the best armor in the game for this character, the graceful cloth. This actually isn't even armor, it's just stat filled clothing, right? But it's kind of perfect for this build. And I'm honestly tempted to just wear it for the entire career of this character. It's so good. First of all, it gives advantage on all dexterity-based skill checks, making our lock picking and trap disarming and stealthing just that much better. But then it increases our dexterity by two, up to a cap of 20. And it's really kind of difficult to overestimate how good that is. I mean, that's a whole feat, right? And there's no such thing as like an elixir of dexterity like we have for strength, right? With elixirs of giant strength. Bonuses to dexterity are fairly hard to come by, and we're not gonna have many feats on this build. Now, sure, we could potentially get a higher armor class with other armor, though later on that will be less pronounced, as we'll discuss, but if and when you do get this armor slash clothing, which you buy off that merchant lady, Esther, right after you take Mountain Path on the way to the crash, right? Once you get it, and then after you've dealt with anti-ethyl, you're gonna have a 20 dexterity with no feats if you start with a 17, right? Meaning you could take something else here instead of bumping our decks. So sure, you could take alert, you could bump your constitution, but the one that I think I would most recommend actually is kind of a surprise to me and something I have yet to even talk about in any of my Baldur's Gate 3 builds to date, Savage Attacker. I know, D&D vets, I know. Just stay with me here. <laughs> so yes, it took me a long time to come around to this feat in Baldur's Gate 3, actually, because I'm bringing my D&D 5e biases to the table. In D&D, this feat sucks. It sucks! You're gonna love it. <laughs> it rerolls the damage of your melee attack, then uses the higher roll. Cool. But in 5e, rules as written, it only applies to your weapon's damage, meaning that at best, it would add less than two points of damage to your attacks on average, sometimes nothing, right, if you roll higher on the first roll. And yeah, if you're using a d4 or a d6 weapon, it's less than one point of damage as an increase on average. I mean, you know, double that if you crit, but still, pretty meh. But in Baldur's Gate 3, it is quite a bit better. and. 
I've kind of known this for a while, but I've still been stubbornly resisting the math until now. Because you see, in Baldur's Gate 3, if you have things that add damage to your weapon attacks, like a ring that adds a d4 of damage to your weapon attacks, or gloves that add a d6 of damage to your weapon attacks, etc., then those things get re-rolled as well. And if you're reliably getting critical hits, and are very interested in bursting down an enemy or three before they even get to take a turn in combat, then all those damage dice are doubled. And the way the game handles this is that it re-rolls each die separately and takes the higher roll every time. In other words, if your weapon normally does a d6 of damage, but you crit, so it's 2d6, right? Right? It doesn't roll 2d6 two times and then take the higher result. It rolls each d6 separately twice and then takes the higher result of each. So if the first 2d6 roll gets you a 5 and a 2 and the second 2d6 roll gets you a 3 and a 6, then it's going to take the 5 from the first roll and the 6 from the second. And it will repeat that for all other instances of adding damage dice to your attack. Now, frustratingly and inexplicably, this doesn't work for sneak attack. I don't know why. It works for Divine Smite, which is essentially the same wording and mechanic. Maybe it's because sneak attack can work on ranged weapons and isn't just melee. I don't know. That really annoys me, but the feat is still definitely worth considering, depending especially on the other gear that you have. Because yeah, re-rolling 2d6 is going to get you almost two more points of damage on average. Re-rolling 2d4 is going to get you a little over one more point of damage. And so if you've got a few sources of extra damage dice and you're critting with reliability, it can pretty quickly add up to a lot more consistent damage when you need it most. Outside of Divine Smite builds, the feat will rarely increase your damage to the levels of like Great Weapon Master, Sharpshooter bonuses, but it also doesn't have the minus five to hit penalty of those feats, right? So it makes the feat feel a lot more akin to say like the damage bonus that you'd get from Tavern Brawler, right? Which is no small thing. Anyways, I still don't necessarily consider the feat to be a no-brainer on this build. Maybe if it worked on Sneak Attack, it would be. But if we're looking to really maximize our damage, and we're going melee instead of ranged, primarily, then I do think it's the way to go. Obviously, if you're focused on playing this build as a ranged character, take Sharpshooter here. But at level five. Okay, so there's a saying among D&D veterans that I've often repeated myself on the channel in the past that goes like this. The best rogues take no more than three levels in rogue. For the record, that's not always true, but the main reason that that seems to be a common consensus, I think, is this. Uh, rogues don't get extra attack. And while sneak attack damage does scale with more rogue levels, it usually can't keep up with more attacks, or I suppose more and better spells if you are to multi-class into a full spellcaster. Sorry, arcane tricksters, your spell progression is just too slow, you don't count. So does that wisdom hold true in BG3 as well? Unfortunately, I think for the most part, yeah, but on this build, it's not quite so clear. I mean, extra attack is great, more attacks means more damage, right? But keep in mind that in BG3, getting surprise is a lot easier, and assassins in this game can reliably get three turns before their enemies get to do anything in combat. With that in mind, I think we might actually be better off staying rogue, at least for now. That said, Sure, respecking into a different class now that we're level five that does have extra attack is gonna mean worse burst damage, but probably better sustained damage after you get through those early rounds of combat. So should we respec here? Maybe, depends on your gear and what you're enjoying most about the build. I'm gonna assume that we're respecking here because eventually we are going to want to do it anyways. Whether you do it now or maybe later, like probably at level eight when you can have both extra attack and enough level levels to keep assassin is up to you. As for the class that we're going to respec into, no, not Gloomstalker. Get out of here with your Gloomstalkers. Okay, fine. Gloomstalker is really good. But my favorite choice here for this build is the monk. Because monks can become shadow monks. And even though Way of the Open Hand is arguably the best monk for sustained damage, when it comes to stealthy, strike hard, and vanish in a cloud of smoke, and teleport all around the battlefield, bursty, assassiny goodness, the shadow monk is definitely the way to go. So let me quickly go over what Monk 1 through 5 looks like then. First, we get Unarmored Defense, which lets us add our Wisdom and Dexterity modifiers to our armor class if we're unarmored and unshielded. It's a good thing 
thing, we got that graceful cloth and a 14 or maybe 16 wisdom plus a 20 dex now, right? That's a pretty decent AC. We also get martial arts here, which lets our monk weapon attacks and unarmed attacks use our dexterity instead of our strength. And those unarmed strikes do a d4 of damage instead of just a flat one. And we can even make an unarmed strike as a bonus action attack if we take the attack action. That's nice, but probably not something we're gonna make a ton of use of on this build, honestly. We wanna be dual wielding, both for the nice bonuses and benefits we can get from like the weapons themselves, right? They're kind of stat sticks. But also because a lot of extra damage we can get from other gear is going to add extra damage to our weapon attacks specifically, and not necessarily our unarmed strikes. What's more, you can't use sneak attack with unarmed strikes, and damage from Savage Attacker doesn't get re-rolled for unarmed strikes like it does for weapon attacks. So while I think there will be times that unarmed strikes are called for, specifically if the enemy has vulnerability to bludgeoning damage, or if we're using Flurry of Blows, more on that in a second, generally, if we're attacking with our bonus action, we're gonna be using our offhand weapon as opposed to our fists and feet on this build. So, okay, we also get our key points here right at Monk 1 in BG3 as opposed to in D&D, and we get two of them right off the bat. So one more than we get in D&D. These reset on a short rest, and we use them to fuel a bunch of cool Monk abilities. Right now, the only thing we can use them for is Flurry of Blows, which lets us spend a bonus action and a key point to make two unarmed strikes instead of just one. Now, one nice thing about this is that you can do it without needing to take the attack action first, meaning you could potentially open with Flurry of Blows if you wanted to get in two attacks from stealth, say, and then still have your full action and a surprised enemy, which will be nice if we've got extra attack but aren't yet assassins again, right? Okay, Monk 2. Unarmored movement. Uh, this says that if we're unarmored and unshielded, we have an extra 10 feet of move speed. Always nice for a melee build, especially. We also get new ways to use our key points here. Patient defense lets us use a key point to take the dodge action as a bonus action, causing attacks against us to have disadvantage. It can be handy sometimes. And then step of the wind says that we can spend a key point to take the dash or disengage action as a bonus action. That's something we can do for free when we get rogue level two back in the build, right? But at least we've got an option for it here. At Monk 3, we get Deflect Missiles. This lets us use a reaction to reduce damage to us when we're hit by a ranged attack, right? I find this coming up a lot more often in BG3 than in D&D, personally. And we can even spend a key point to throw the missile back if we reduce the damage to zero, which can be cool. And then, yes, we get our Monk subclass here. And as I've said, we're going with Shadow Monk, which is definitely the most flavorful of all Monk subclasses. It is Super Ninja. At this level, Shadow Monks get a couple of features. Shadow Arts Hide lets us hide as a bonus action. Again, not that cool if we're a rogue too, but for now it's nice to get that ability back. And then we get a limited selection of spells from Shadow Arts spells as well. Namely, Darkness, Pass Without Trace, Dark Vision, Silence, and the Minor Illusion Cantrip. Now, none of these spells are particularly powerful like in every situation, right? But they can be really great in certain specific instances. I've already mentioned using darkness. In this game, ranged attacks can't penetrate the cloud of darkness, so it's easy to cast it on yourself and then pop out, make some attacks, and then pop back in if you're facing a bunch of ranged enemies or casters who need to see you. I mean, I trivialized the hag encounter with silence, casting it on her before she could duplicate herself and then just stun locking her inside that bubble of silence. It felt really awesome, actually. So yeah, look for ways to take advantage of these spells. In the right situation, they're really strong. I wish they didn't cost two of our very precious key points to cast them, but sometimes it'll be worth it. At Monk 4, we get slow fall. This lets us use our reaction to have falling damage. Have. Half. Cut it in half, right? Not just have falling damage. Oh, good. I'm going to have some falling damage. <laughs> uh, that's nice when you need it. And then for the feet that we'd get here, again, you know, bump, bump decks if you don't have the graceful cloth yet. But if you do, yeah, savage attacker is nice, but increasing wisdom is also worth considering. So pick what feels best to you, because not only will a wisdom bump increase important skill checks and wisdom saving throws, but as a monk, it's going to also bump our armor class and then make our monk abilities harder for enemies to resist, right? Because yeah, I'm talking here primarily about what we get at Monk 5, Stunning Strike. This is such a great ability when it works. 
I wish they made it a little more like how it works in 5e where it can just be applied on a hit if you want instead of having to actively select I'm going to stunning strike them now. It needs to be like toggleable, like a uh, divine smite or sneak attack, right? Because as is, we can't, for example, use flurry of blows and stunning strike. But even worse, in 5e, it lasts until the end of your next turn instead of the beginning, uh, like it does in BG3. It's still a great ability. You try to hit them, and if it lands, and they fail a constitution saving throw against it, then they're stunned, meaning they can't do anything, and attacks against them have advantage. In my playthrough of this build, I found myself spending more key points on stunning strike than anything else for most fights, honestly. And yeah, after the Nova rounds were over, it made cleanup that much easier. And as a result, I am very tempted to bump Wisdom instead of take Savage Attacker with our feet, but I think either is a great choice. We do, of course, get extra attack at this level as well, meaning our sustained damage is a little better now, as we'd get two attacks every time we take the attack action, making it four attacks total if coupled with Flurry of Blows, right? Not bad at all. But to be honest, I think my favorite Shadow Monk feature is Cloak of Shadows, and Larian, bless their souls, have decided to give it to us at level 5 instead of making us wait clear until level 11 like they do in 5e, and that is freaking awesome. It lets us go invisible as an action, period. Unlimited use, no resource cost. Now, it only works if we're in dim light or darkness, and it breaks if we walk through a patch of bright light, so you gotta be careful where you're walking here. This is the skin of a killer, Bill. But I've found that in this game, it's pretty easy to find a patch of at least dim light on almost every battlefield. And this just totally changes the way that we can play this character now, where instead of hitting and running, we can hit and vanish, hit and vanish, and it's just so cool. Now, admittedly, combat can get a little long if we're only getting a bonus action attack and then disappearing and trying to repeat that, right? Especially as enemies tend to reset their health if combat breaks once you vanish. But you can always pop out of stealth, take out one enemy, maybe over a round or two, then vanish. And, you know, drink a health potion if need be, it's not going to break invisibility, and then, you know, go again. I just love the feel of playing this way more than anything. It makes you feel like a true master of shadows, and it's so great. Coupled with the fun Shadow Monk spells that you get, as well as Stunning Strike and Flurry of Blows, is just really, really cool. It reminds me a lot of my rogue build from World of Warcraft, and that fills me with all kinds of happy nostalgia. But next level, it gets even better. Because at level six, let's stick with Monk, that means we get Shadow Step. Now we will have an on-demand Misty Step as well. It lets us use a bonus action to teleport from one area of Dim Light or Darkness to another area of Dim Light or Darkness, and then gives us advantage on our next attack that we make this turn. The best part is, I think, it doesn't break our Cloak of Shadows, so we can vanish, teleport to the other side of the battlefield, and then next turn, open up on enemies from a completely different position, and it's just so cool. And in a pinch, you can always throw darkness down on yourself if you're in bright light and you can't get to a shadow, right? And then teleport to a shadowy spot. Or teleport into the darkness if you cast the darkness spell away from yourself because you're in a shadow now, but where you want to go is bright light. There's just so many ways to play with all of these abilities together now. You really feel like Nightcrawler. It's so awesome. <laughs> We also get key empowered strikes at Monk 6, which is pretty important. A lot of enemies have resistance to non-magical bludgeoning, piercing, or slashing damage, and this feature overcomes that bludgeoning resistance in the case of our unarmed strikes. That said, again, I don't actually use unarmed strikes a lot on this build, and also, frustratingly, I think, I find that a lot of enemies have resistance to all kinds of bludgeoning, piercing, and slashing damage in this game, whether it's magical or not, and that's really annoying, if I'm being honest. <laughs> so, this feature feels less important in BG3 than it does in D&D &D to me, and yeah, especially on this build. Still, it is nice to have, and yeah, I do flurry of blows occasionally, especially against a surprised enemy where I can get two critical hits with one bonus action thanks to flurry of blows, right? Depending on what other gear I have. So yeah, nice to have. But at level 7, I think I'm probably respecking again. <laughs> And yeah, you definitely don't have to do this, but you guys know me. I 
tend to respec almost every level just to try and make every single level like as optimal as I can. So at seven, I think we just do a simple respec to either go Rogue One Monk Six or Fighter Two Monk Five. Starting as Rogue One again will let us keep all of our sweet Shadow Monk features, but give us more skills, better skills, and you know especially expertise for way better sleight of hand and perception checks, and then a little more damage via sneak attack. But since I'm planning on taking fighter levels eventually on this build anyway, spoiler alert. Let's assume here that we went uh, Fighter Two Monk Five. Giving up Shadow Step makes me sad, but don't worry, we will get it back eventually. Fighter 2 is just going to be a really nice way to add just a little more burst damage. That's what I'm primarily interested in it for. So let's take a look at what that would look like really quick. First up, starting as Fighter 1 gives us some really nice additional proficiencies. Constitution saving throw proficiency means that we're going to be able to add our proficiency bonus to our concentration checks, right? And for those of us often using darkness and silence, pass without trace, as well as a spell that we might have from a piece of gear, right a concentration spell that's going to be really nice letting us hold on to concentration a lot more reliably now we also get heavy and medium armor proficiency now I'm personally a little hesitant to put armor on this version of the monk like I did for, say, my Way of Four Elements build that you can find there, or like I did when I actually played a Tavern Brawler open hand monk in one of my playthroughs. In BG3, all you lose as a monk by armoring yourself is your unarmored movement, which isn't nothing, but it's not the end of the world, right? And there is some great medium and heavy armor out there, especially the medium armor options that will let you add your full dexterity to your AC and not cause disadvantage on stealth checks. That said, I love the Graceful Cloth so much for this build that I am really loath to give it up. And with our decent wisdom modifier, our AC doesn't increase that much from the armor options out there if we were to put medium armor on. When I soloed the game with this build, and I put solo in quotes intentionally, I actually still had party members to buff me with things like Shield of Faith and Long Strider and Warding Bond, etc. And then just like left those companions back at camp some of you may consider that cheating for a solo run that's fine but especially if you go that route with a 20 dex and a 16 wisdom you really don't feel squishy at all on this build and it doesn't feel like you really need a better armor class i don't think so i'm content to save myself a feat and keep advantage on the dexterity skill checks and just forego the armor right but if you find something that you really love that's worth the sacrifice Go for it. You also get martial weapon proficiency as a fighter one, and that's nice because there just might be a longsword or rapier or something else out there that you really want to equip, though if you wanted to dual wield them, right, you'd have to swap out the savage attacker feat for the dual wielder feat, which could be worth it depending on the weapons. It bumps your AC by one, two, so again, keep that option open. It might mean that you'd need to be drinking uh, giant strength elixirs, but that's fairly easy to do. If nothing else, there's probably going to be a longbow or a heavy crossbow or something that you're going to want to put in your ranged slot, and so now you can do that without worrying about not having proficiency in the weapon, right? Also as a fighter one, we get second wind, which lets us heal ourselves a little bit as a bonus action once per short rest. And then we get a fighting style, which I'm gonna say, let's take two weapon fighting. This is gonna be a nice little damage bump for us, letting us finally add our dexterity modifier to our offhand bonus action attack now too. But then at fighter two, we'd get action surge, of course, letting us once per short rest, take two actions on our turn instead of one, meaning that even if we don't have assassination levels again yet, <laughs> we can at least jump a target from stealth and then get a full round of attacks against them while they're surprised, while still having our most important tools from Shadow Monk. Or sure, cast a spell on our turn and make some attacks, etc, etc. It just brings a lot of potential damage and versatility, and it's hard to oversell the power of Action Surge, honestly. But at level 8, I'm going to respec yet again into what I consider to be like the core of the build, and that is Rogue 3 Monk 5. This would let us get the most important features from Monk, Extra Attack, Stunning Strike, and Cloak of Shadows, as well as the most important features from Assassin, Auto Crits, three turns before our opponent gets to take an action, sneak attack, expertise. At this point in the game, the build really shines in all the important ways burst damage, subterfuge, mobility, and it's just so much freaking fun to play. You want to see it? 
All right, here you go. But first, you know what? Why don't we go over some gear choices? Not so that I can tell you like what the best in slot items are for this point in the game, but just to kind of go over some options, let you know what's available, what kinds of things you can be looking for. The helm, the haste helm, that's nice. It gives you a little extra move speed early on, nothing amazing. Cloak of protection is probably the best cloak we can get at this point, I think. My beloved Graceful Cloth, of course, that we've already talked about. The Flawed Helldust Gloves might be the best gloves we can get here in Act 2 anyways, only because they do extra damage both on weapon attacks and also on unarmed attacks, which is kind of unique, really nice. And yeah, it's a D4 of damage, not flat damage, which we prefer. I like the Nightwalker boots that you get off Nair, uh, both for the Misty Step and also to keep us from getting ensnared and things. As for weapons, the Sword of Life Stealing is probably the best main hand weapon I think we can get here by this point, primarily because on a crit, it deals extra damage and we crit a lot. One problem is it only works against those that aren't constructs or undead. We fight a lot of undead in Act 2, so it's kind of good in some fights, not very good in others. But then yeah, it gives you some extra temporary hit points too, which is nice. The Knife of the Undermountain King might be the best offhand in the game. Uh, that's debatable, but definitely by this point. Primarily because, yeah, it reduces the number we need to roll to get a crit by one, right? So we're critting on a 19 now, which is awesome. It has other benefits too. Too. There's lots of different amulet options here. I like the amulet of the harpers. The shield spell once per long rest is nice in a pinch, but there are other decent choices here too. As for rings, uh, let's get into it a little bit. Strange conduit ring is one of my favorites. It says that while we're concentrating on a spell, then we deal an extra d4 of psychic damage, which is awesome and makes me want to always be concentrating on a spell, right? Otherwise, you know, I like the Risky Ring because advantage on attacks not only lets us hit and crit more often, but for us, lets us use a sneak attack even outside of our opening rounds, right? But there are some other decent ones. Uh, the Caustic Band, of course, an extra two damage on all hits. Not bad, though we'd prefer a die of damage because that way we'd benefit both from critical hits and also savage attacks, right? And then there's the Eversight Ring. This ring is really awesome on this build. It prevents us from being blinded. And if you recall, when we're in our own darkness bubble, we are blinded, right? Not with this ring. And thus, just like a warlock with a devil sight invocation, we could make attacks with advantage from within that darkness bubble. Enemies attacking us would have disadvantage. It's just really awesome. I didn't have it equipped because I was concentrating on a spell other than darkness uh, on the last fight, but I think I'm gonna use darkness here and just kind of show this off. So I'll equip it in a second once I'm outside of turn-based mode. As for ranged weapons, yeah, speaking of concentrating on another spell, my favorite ranged weapon at this point in the game is the Darkfire Shortbow because it gives us access to the haste spell. We can only use it once per day, but on a really tough fight, it's awesome to have, right? Once that's used up, though, I like to go back to the Bow of the Banshee, which is pretty nice. It says that when we hit an enemy with it, we can potentially frighten them, which is great in and of itself, but then against frightened enemies, we do an extra d4 of damage. And again, if we're critting, that's 2d4, and that's gonna benefit from Savage Attacker, etc., etc. So a really nice option. All right, let's see what it looks like in combat then. First off, we'll go invisible. And we've got a little fight here that should be fairly short and sweet. I don't think that's going to be a problem. Why don't we start off by uh, trying to fear one of them. Yeah, we can sneak attack. They made their save, didn't they? Well, regardless, time to run in and uh, see what we can do. Let's actually toggle off. Two up and fighting there. Because, as I thought, I didn't need it, leaving us with our bonus action still and our regular action. Nope, don't need paralyzing critical. Yeah, this is going pretty well, I would say. All right, not a bad little surprise round. Nobody else gets to go, and now I can probably finish them off. Oof, unless I get a critical miss. <laughs> All right, here we go. Save the best for last. Just have my bonus action. All 
All right. Ouch. Oh, I just lost concentration. Well, that's all right. Because I wanted to show off darkness anyway. Okay. See, now I have advantage. I'm getting sneak attack. Oh, sure. And they're paralyzed. Nobody can see me. This guy doesn't know what to do. So let's finish her off. No need. No need. I'll use that on this guy. No, oh, didn't need that either. Anyways, that was an easy fight. Obviously, they're not all gonna go that smoothly, but as you can tell, really, really strong for the first few rounds of combat. And after that, you're kind of in cleanup mode, right? Yeah. So much fun, so dang powerful. And in case you missed it, uh, go back. I have a discussion about gear while I've got my like character's inventory open so I can kind of talk about gear options, what you should be looking for, etc. All right, so at level nine, again, sorry to be a little nebulous here, but I think we've got two options. Either you're gonna want to go Rogue 4, Monk 5, if you really want another feat, right? Maybe you want to increase your wisdom and have Savage Attacker, or you want Dual Wielder and Savage Attacker, or you just want to bump your wisdom all the way to 20. That's not a bad route. Alternatively, though, and the way that I decided to go, you could go Rogue 3, Monk 6 to get another key point and get Shadow Step back because Shadow Step is just so dang cool, and I love it with all of my heart. You make the call. But regardless of your choice, at level 10, we're respecking once again. <laughs> <laughs> you don't have to, but I would go back to Rogue 3, Monk 5, Fighter 2. So we can have all of our most important Shadow Assassin abilities, plus Action Surge for big, huge, massive burst when our enemy is surprised. Five attacks that are all auto crits, six if like you're hasted, right? Maybe seven, I guess, depending on what difficulty level you're playing at. Yes, please. That is insane damage. But a level 11, we're finally done with respecking for good. I would say either grab Monk 6 here to get Shadow Step back, or if you're more interested in damage, go for Fighter 3, because that will let us get our Fighter subclass. And that means we could be a Battlemaster, which is by far my favorite Fighter subclass available to us in BG3. As a Battlemaster, we can learn three maneuvers and gain four superiority dice per short rest to spend on those maneuvers. Those superiority dice, they're D8s, and the maneuvers then would enhance our attacks in a variety of ways if we decided to use them, depending on which maneuvers we chose. The three that I would take are first up, trip attack, of course, as that would let us add the D8 superiority die in damage, and remember, if we crit, and we often crit, that becomes 2d8. And it should work with Savage Attacker, though. Crap, I didn't test that. <laughs> does it work with Savage Attacker? I really hope it does. If Divine Smite does, it totally should. But anyways, with Trip Attack, we do extra damage and then potentially knock the enemy prone, giving us advantage on all of our other melee attacks, regardless of whether or not we have darkness going, etc. I also really love here Menacing Attack, which potentially frightens enemies, preventing them from moving, say, out of our darkness bubble, for example, and gives them disadvantage on their ability checks and attack rolls. That's really nice, especially if we have that Bow of the Banshee that I mentioned, because with that bow equipped, we do extra damage to frighten targets, right? And then for the third one, I think I would take Sweeping Attack. This lets us damage multiple enemies if they're standing next to each other, and yeah, if you've got two surprised enemies standing together, that's gonna be freaking awesome. At level 12 then, assuming we went Fighter 3 at level 11, I would go back to Monk 6 yet again for Shadow Step, more key, etc. And that, everybody, completes the build. I honestly have had so much fun playing this build in-game, in case you have not been able to tell by my enthusiasm throughout this video. More than any other solo build to date, I would say. Does it have weaknesses? Sure. It's not amazing at saving throws, and that can really throw a wrench in the works if you're trying to run solo especially. It's also not fantastic damage outside of your opening rounds. It's no slouch, but 
I wouldn't call it like cream of the crop either. Fortunately, we have a lot of tools that let us reset the fight after we get through those first few rounds of combat. So I guess you could argue that its sustained damage is amazing because its sustained damage is also its burst damage, right? <laughs> and that's just so cool. Though there are some fights that you're not going to be able to reset it, whether because the enemies can see through your invisibility or you just don't have like dim light or darkness that are going to let you vanish, etc., right? And yeah, it's never going to be a great face, meaning you might have to brace yourself for conversations not always going the way you want them to, etc. For all of these reasons, I'm not super confident that the build would be a great one to try and solo honor mode with, for example. I think it could be done, but it might not be the best build for a solo honor mode run. Uh, do I have any cards left? Maybe if you used the ranged version of this build, I think it might work a little better in honor mode, but I could be wrong. If you have soloed honor mode with this build or something very similar, I'd love to hear about it in the comments. Uh, maybe it would perform better than I'm anticipating, but as part of a team for honor mode, or soloing balanced or even tactician, I can say from personal experience that it is smooth as butter and an absolute delight. All that bamfing and critting and vanishing back into the shadows just makes the game not only a ton of fun, but so much different to play than most other builds that using it has absolutely made for one of, if not my favorite playthroughs of the game yet. So I certainly hope that you get to try it out for yourself very soon. But I also certainly hope that you know that I love you. Thank you so much for all that you do for me, for the channel. I hope that you have a really great day and a fantastic week. And if you don't, I hope that you will hang in there. You've got this. I hope that you will do good and be kind and that I see you again very soon. But until then, take care. Bye. Time sharpens, heightens each sensation, darkness stirs and wakes imagination. Silently the senses abandon their defenses. Close your eyes and surrender to your darkest dreams. Purge your thoughts of the life you knew before. Close your eyes, let your spirit start to soar. <laughs> And you'll live as you've never lived before. <laughs> Taking the cheese to a whole new level. So, um, yeah, my <laughs> this morning I was like asking my wife as we were getting ready. I'm like, hey, honey, what song should I sing for my outtakes today? <laughs> It's a, it's a build about, like, a stealthy, like, dark, you know, shadowy assassin. <laughs> She's like, a Phantom of the Opera? <laughs> and I laughed, and I was like, well, now I'm definitely doing that. Uh, so, yeah, there you go. Um, here's something that will make you realize that I'm even nerdier than you maybe realized. Uh, the very first CD that I ever owned, that like I bought with my own money, Phantom of the Opera. So yeah, I'm not only like a D&D &D nerd, but I'm like a theater nerd too. Admittedly, not as much as I would like to be. Like I did some plays in high school and stuff like that, but like, yeah, I, I'd like to be more of a theater nerd than I am. So, um, it, it, why am I sharing this? Too much information. I don't know. When I get to these outtakes, I just, I just start spilling my guts. I'm getting a colonoscopy tomorrow morning. <laughs> and I'm so excited. Um, it's just a routine, you know, you're old enough now and you need to get a colonoscopy thing. So nothing to be too worried about. But today, that means that I'm just not eating anything and I'm just drinking lots of liquids. So this is my lunch. It's um, chicken broth. Mm. 
I'm so hungry. Usually you're like falling down. Now today you want to creep up, huh? Just never satisfied. Okay, hold on. You could, you could, you could put in our constitute. We're gonna, we're, we're gonna want bug. Get away. But as uh, if you have <clears throat> more reliable, uh, it means we'd be. It means we're. Well, yeah. I can't believe how hot this broth is. I made it like two hours ago. This is a really efficient thermos. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> Instead of take savage effect. <laughs> that you. Gosh, these doors. Bye bye.